Good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Good morning. Okay, librarian's job. Shh. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, welcome to Picture Books for Grown-Ups, Why Graphic Novels Matter to Adults, because we will be talking a lot about kids and teens today, and that is wonderful, but we wanted to do some representation for uh, adult graphic novels today. My name is Monica Barrett. I am a reference and collection development librarian at Escondido Public Library, and I also created our adult graphic novel collection, and I'm going to go ahead and let everyone else introduce themselves. I'm Lolly Netraj. Um, Lolly Netraj. I am Monica's colleague at the Escondido Public Library, I, where I am the Adult Literacy Services Librarian, and also um, the Collection Development Librarian for the Adult Literacy Collections, and also the Juvenile um, uh, Graphic Novel Collection. Hi, I'm Amy Wright. I am the manager of School Outreach at the New York Public Library. So we work with about 500 K to 12 schools in New York City. We also have a special collection, and a large part of our special collection is graphic novels. It's also really exciting. We've been doing a lot with graphic novels in New York City with the curriculum. Um, you may know that John Lewis's March was added to the Social Studies curriculum in New York. So we've been doing a lot with graphic novels, and I'm a big nerd myself. First time at San Diego Comic Con, so I'm pretty excited. I'm Matthew Murray. I am a librarian at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I also uh, am co-host of the Reading Through Advisory podcast, The Book Club for Masochists, which you should all go and download. We pick a different genre every month that we hate and read books from it. We just did, <laughs> we just did legal thrillers. It was awful. Um, uh, I also uh, edit for the comic book review website, uh, No Flying, No Tights, which is by and aimed at librarians. And I make the zine uh, Two-Fisted Library Stories so you should check that out as well. My name is Steve Torres Roman. I am a student librarian here at the San Diego Public Library. I started the first graphic novel discussion group on August 14th at, in 2003, and we won the Illinois Community Council uh, Volunteer Youth Talent Award for that program, uh, working with youth in graphic novel days and graphic novel discussed, and uh, including the reading scores for that program in 2007. So why do graphic novels matter? They provide accessibility to works we might not otherwise read. They address multiple literacies. They are the bridge between art and literature. I don't think we can deny that. And they are a legitimate form of media and art. That's, that's the one that I put in there, and I think it's really important because we never have discussions about like, why do we have poetry in libraries? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not something that ever, like people aren't, you know, getting upset that we have, you know, like erotic poetry in libraries. Yeah. It's like, our children might be reading erotic poetry. This is the worst thing ever. Um, and so to me, it, 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 it frustrates me that people don't view it just as like another form of, of art and media uh, that is just as valid um, as any other. Uh, regarding accessibility, um, definitely we have classic works of literature that are now in an illustrated graphic novel form. And so, you know, we've actually had teens coming in that couldn't find uh, a book that they needed to read for a school project, and their teachers have actually, thank goodness, been allowing them to go to our graphic novel section and take the same book, just in an illustrated form. Uh, and that's also a good gateway into an introduction to this is a form of literature. This is important stuff. Um, I also have a, a high school teacher who uh, had, was giving me input on this and saying that in his classroom he uses uh, superheroes and um, he, he teaches older high school kids. He uses superhero posters because he finds them to be very safe, very welcoming, and just a really great way to introduce kids to like heroes and that the, all the ideals that that uh, puts across. And he uh, also teaches humanities and uh, morals and things like that through actually specifically adult graphic novels because of the themes and the difficulty of the reading levels that he finds there. When we talk about accessibility to books that we might not otherwise read, um, you know, we could also have a critical conversation about how we view literature in our society. And as Matt mentioned, um, 
why we don't view comics as a legitimate medium. From an adult literacy context, um, I would add that there's a lot of great works of literature that people who struggle with their English uh, reading comprehension skills cannot access, but they do want to immerse themselves in those worlds. Um, you know, popular culture is filled with a lot of reference to the classics. You know, when we think of Downton Abbey, things like that. And for people who are struggling with those skills, how can we make that content accessible to them? And I think comics are definitely one major way we could do that. I'd like to address multiple literacies, actually. One of the things that, uh, well, usually when we talk about literacy, most people presume we're talking about textual literacy, right? Symbolism, imagery, or down to the most basic level, can you understand what the words are saying? But they, I think most people don't realize that, yes, comics have that same depth uh, in visual literacy. For example, um, the first issue of Captain America Comics, I wish I had the slide up, but I don't, sorry, um, shows Captain America punching out Adolf Hitler on the first cover of Captain America Comics way back in 1941. Now, at the most basic level of visual literacy, right, can we recognize who's supposed to be Captain America in this picture? Maybe the guy wearing the flag probably would be Captain America, right? But then you get another layer beyond that. For example, everyone's familiar with Captain America from the movies, comics, right? What does Captain America carry around with him? Shield. What does that represent? When you use a shield, what do you use it for? Protect. <laughs> Defend, right? He doesn't carry a gun. He doesn't carry a sword. He carries a shield. And then you go one layer beyond that, right? Everyone knows who Steve Rogers is. It's Captain America's alternate identity. What color hair does Steve Rogers have? Blonde. What color eyes does he have? Blue. Here is your pumped up Aryan ideal. But instead of fighting for the Nazis, He's putting on the American flag, and he's punching out Hitler. And he's doing it on the cover of a comic with the symbol of America, supposedly, nine months. Because this came out in 19, March 1941, nine months before Pearl Harbor. Nine months before American involvement in World War II, Captain America's punching out Hitler. And it's that depth of visual literacy that we're talking about that you can get from these comics. I would say, um, does any, everybody know the joke about the New Yorker cartoons? Okay, come on, people. The joke about the New Yorker cartoons. The joke is that like most of us don't fully understand the New Yorker cartoons, but we're all at the water pool. Like, yeah, I totally <laughs> got that cartoon. Um, so I had the great pleasure, if you guys don't know, superstar comic book librarian Karen Green from Columbia. We actually toured her collection um, just this past week. And one of the things we talked about is that nobody Everybody thinks that political cartoons have that depth. Everybody thinks that political cartoons take so much to decode, but nobody still, we're still doing these panels, you know, five, 10, 15 years later, saying comics have the same validity. But there's decoding, there's the visual literacy, there's all of these hidden clues, cultural clues, everything. And yet we're still having these discussions. Um, one of the things I think is great about this panel is to get adults on board. So I work with K to 12, but I do professional development with educators. And so one of the things I'm always recommending is to not just books for the classroom, to put books for them as readers. Because if I can hook them as readers and get them to understand <coughs> that comic books are valid, then hopefully they will really appreciate why it's important to use them in the classroom. I think we're gonna go ahead and move on. So why invest in an adult graphic novel collection? The popular culture, cultural connection, meaning community demand, local interest, especially out here. Teaching tools for adult learners and circulation, I have a lot to say about that. We'll let you guys go first. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, in budgets are limited everywhere, so why invest in this particular collection? Um, when I came to Escondido Library, we had a very high circulating juvenile and teen graphic novel collection, and there were a few things in the teen graphic novel collection that were definitely more mature in the illustrations, in the contents, in the themes. And I was concerned with the, that the teen librarian might be challenged by some parents on some of the things that were in that collection. Now, of course, you know that libraries, we don't like censorship and that kind of thing. So we do not, uh, at our library anyway, have any way to check on who's checking out what. But now we have a separate adult graphic novel collection that 
adults can come to, older teens can come to if they choose so, and they can go home with these, these materials that are labeled adult graphic novels, and that way parents are still absolutely welcome to challenge, but at least we have a leg to stand on and say that, you know, we're sorry to hear that you feel this way, but these are adult graphic novels, so talk to your teen. Um, circulation numbers, I just want to mention that our, our adult graphic novel collection has been uh, about 18 months going now. The first six months I only had $500 because they just wanted to see if this was something that would actually work. After that, um, I've been allowed to use it at my discretion within our fiction budget. And since that happened, so for the last 12 months, we've seen almost a 1,500% increase in the circulation of that collection. We've made it one of the challenges for our summer reading challenge um, is to read a, a graphic novel from that collection. And because it has nonfiction, because it has classic literature, it's been a fairly easy sell for adults to you know, be introduced to this. And it is, I believe, the third highest circulating um, collection in our library, and that's including DVDs and, and children's literature. I wanted to add that uh, with respect to local interest, we definitely, as a San Diego um, area library, exploit the connection to Comic-Con um, by having our graphic novel collections uh, so um, well displayed. Uh, Monica did not add that we have a wonderful graphic uh, artist in our library who has created um, beautiful visuals and uh, promotional materials for that collection. Um, it's a really stunning display but um, the people that it attracts uh, are potentially people who are interested in this um, popular cultural uh, phenomenon in San Diego, our Comic-Con. And so um, we take pride in that connection and by having these um, novels out there, these graphic novels, we are potentially attracting people who otherwise uh, may not have come into our library but are now finding, um, in addition to graphic novels, um, other things that appeal to them. Well, just for San Diego alone, in uh, San Diego Public Library System, we circulated in the last year, our graphic novel collection circulated almost 160,000 circulations, so it's huge. And you might have an adult graphic novel collection because adults are the majority of readers of graphic novels. Um, according to the site Graphic Policy, which uh, monitors graphic novel readership using Facebook data, 56% um, of graphic novel readers between the ages of 18 and 33. This is the sort of thing that kind of drives me crazy when people say, like, why? Because it's not like people are asking, why do you have adult movies in your library? You know, there's, there's never, like, you could not have any of these R-rated movies in your library. And the same thing happens with, uh, with video games as well as comics sometimes, and that people are, are saying, you know, that they don't, libraries, when they, if they do collect video games, frequently don't have, um, you know, more mature rated ones, uh, which frustrates me as an adult. No, I mean, with budget, we're all under such tight budget constraints, and so we're constantly being asked to justify with the collection the ROI, return on investment, in terms of our graphic novels over and over again have shown that they are one of the best ROIs that we can invest in with our collection development budget, and yet we don't, most libraries do not have a graphic novel uh, line earmarked. If they do, it's very small, like you mentioned, yours is within fiction, which is great, at least it's there, but it's, it's not acknowledging the nonfiction graphic novels, a lot of them are art-focused graphic novels or things, so I think it's just still, even though we have the data, it's not quite actually built into operation. Like nobody has suggested, for example, cutting you know, the amount of copies you buy of James Patterson's books every year. Sorry, James Patterson, you do a lot of good work for libraries, but what I'm saying is we don't necessarily pick apart a kind of status quo of how we collect for a lot of other things, but maybe we really need to for graphic novels just also because we're under so much scrutiny with our budget. And I just want to quickly add about the um, teaching tools for adult learners. Graphic novels are significantly different from uh, early literacy uh, tools that we use to teach children how to read. Um, incorporating those types of tools like picture books um, does not really work as well with adult learners. Uh, there is a sophisticated ways of thinking as adults and graphic novels do a better job of addressing that and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's talk a little bit about the value in academic libraries. You want to read it? Or? You guys can read. 
I'm trying to keep this going a little faster. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the two areas, I guess I'm the one that has to talk about this as the academic oh. librarian on the panel. It's all me. Um, all you. The, the two areas that I think are really interesting that I want to talk about are the first are we're really beginning to see the creation of comic book slash graphic novel studies programs in universities. And it's like how film studies was several decades where people wanted to study this stuff and they were just finding wherever they could to, to fit it in. So like people doing it in like English departments and other departments like that. And that's what's happening with comics right now is that people are, are doing, these, doing the research into it, um, even creating comics as scholarly work, which is really exciting. People are producing things like comics for their thesis. And so what is going to have to be done at some point is I hope in the future we will have things that are like liaison librarians for the comic book department. And not every university is going to have this because, you know, not every university has every different department. But this is going to be something that's coming in the future because there's more and more interest in this field. And I think it's really, really exciting. The other area, which is, which I think is um, perhaps not, um, not obvious to people when, when, when thinking about this, is using, is having graphic novel collections in academic libraries as an educational tool to let people know that they can use these in their work after they leave. And so the two areas that um, are, are getting big is one is graphic medicine, which if you're not aware of, we're using comics um, to sort of um, explain medical things and stuff like that. And there's actually a graphic medicine conference just a few weeks ago in Seattle. And this is getting really, it seems to be gaining a lot of traction there as a way to like kind of explain medical things in, in you know, not just like a really dense text. The other one that we have, and this is something that we have at uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, is in our, um, in our library for um, teachers, or like in the program that teaches teachers, um, we have a, a massive graphic novel collection there, and it's really just teaching the teachers that these are something that exists and that they can use them, and showing them what is there and what they can use in the classroom, because we still have so many people, so many teachers that don't know what's out there, that they have no idea what's available, and so, librarians, academic librarians, kind of have to work with the departments in the school to say, like, these are something that exists. You have to teach your students who are going to be teachers about this, about this resource that is becoming more and more important that they might not have any experience with. Um, and so that's another a really crucial one. And the final thing in the, the note is just recreational reading materials. So, you know, that's also really popular. I wanted to add to what Matt said about um, uh, the scholarship of graphic novels. I have a great quote that I want to share. It's from uh, Johanna Drucker, who is faculty at UCLA's IS School. And uh, she wrote this wonderful uh, piece in about 2008 uh, asking what is graphic about a graphic novel. And she talks about the connection between uh, art and literature, as we mentioned before. But she says, quote, graphic novels synthesize the language of cinema, the sensibilities of contemporary literature, and the appeal of mass media in a format that calls attention to artistry and technique. Rather than operate in the one-off mode of fine art production, graphic novels are the realization of the vision of the democratic art form once trumpeted by champions of the artist book, works of art that circulate widely and freely in consumer culture, even as their sensibility keeps open a place for counterculture sensibilities within the mainstream, end quote. Um, they're able to collect a lot of graphic novels that we can't in the public library. You may have heard the previous panel mention we buy from large vendors, even if we're not buying from large vendors, there's always an issue of cataloging, if you need cataloging. Academic libraries have a responsibility and an ownership of actually collecting them in their subject areas. Um, a lot of the great graphic novels you'll see, not just, I mean, people talk about mouse, but there's fantastic Holocaust graphic novels that are out there from a lot of different people. And similarly, we have uh, graphic novels about mass violence with Rwanda. Um, I was lucky enough to do a history degree in Montreal, and there's a great, fantastic partnership with making sure that they're collecting graphic novels from the Rwandan refugee community in Montreal and also connecting them with Holocaust survivors. So I think we have a really nice opportunity in academic libraries to collect a little bit more mindfully than sometimes we're able to in the public library. We want to, but we're not able to. run through this a little quicker here. But um, distinguishing adult versus youth graphic novels, um, subject matter, of course, and the visuals, of course. 
Um, and I know there's a panel later that's going to talk about ratings, but ratings, uh, especially on the more major comic books um, publishers, they have those as well that will help you purchase that way. Um, but I wanted to also mention themes because whereas some teen graphic novels may talk about certain things, you may have them actually, the characters actually doing those things in the, um, in the adult graphic novels. So I just wanted to mention that. Did you guys have thoughts? You know, it's really tricky um, as someone who collects uh, for juvenile collection, trying to make the distinction between what is appropriate, for example, um, for like juveniles in our library, we uh, distinguish that as um, 12 and under. And then if it's 13 and over, it goes in our teen collection. And uh, one good example I have for you, a specific example is this uh, graphic novel, or sorry, uh, manga series called Card Captor Sakura, is anyone familiar with that? So, according to the reviews I read on No Flying, No Tights, amazing resource, this, this book, or this series, is totally appropriate for a juvenile collection. But for those of you who have read it, um, and I had not read it before purchasing it, I relied on two reviews um, from very um, well-known experts. Uh, for those of you who have not read it, there's some questionable relationships between children and adults that I did not know. And this was uh, brought up to me by a colleague. And so we really had to weigh that, like, because the reviews did reference that information, but they, they ascertained, the reviews, reviewers concluded that those relationships were not clearly defined, and also there's maybe a cultural context because keep in mind, a lot of the manga is subject to translation and interpretation, because um, it's moving from one culture to another. And so I opted to keep it in the collection. But see, those are the kinds of tricky issues that we have to navigate, because again, this is an, a new medium where we have to look at the art and we have to look at the text in tandem. So for those that, of you that were here earlier, um, you heard Candace, who presented last one, say that she, her first graphic novel exposure was with Vertigo books, which I'll say for mature readers. Mm -hmm. um, and what does mature readers even mean is, is, is the question. And I know that I also read all of those as a teenager. And at the, um, at ALA a couple of weeks ago, there was the DC Young Animal panel, um, which is a new imprint they have, uh, spearheaded by Gerard Way. And they have the for mature readers on them as well, but they kind of said like, these are for like, I guess like smart teenagers. Kind of the thing, <laughs> you know. It's like, like they, it, it, they kind of have to say it's for mature readers, but they're like also very aimed at, at YA readers, and so that's the sort of book where it's super tricky. It's like, where do you put that in, in, in your library? Um, also, if you are interested in this, there's a T, what does T for Teen mean session coming up later in the in the afternoon. That was a good plug. Um, I just want to say too, I think it really speaks to what you're talking about the need to have an adult graphic novel collection. I think still too many libraries and schools put all the graphic novels in juve or in teen. And adult is uh, it's sort of like we don't talk about it or they put it side by side with the teen. It really speaks to the fact that, again, we need to build these collections mindfully and we need to have people collecting them or at least be invested in doing the research. I mean, I know for far too many libraries, it gets stuck with somebody who's buying the graphic novels who kind of hates graphic novels. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> what's the worst example everyone's seen on the panel oh, of this uh, is a, good a miscategorized graphic novel? Yeah. Do you want to go first, Melissa? Worst category. I, I saw a copy of um, the the Children's Crusade, <laughs> which is a Vertigo graphic novel, <laughs> in the children's section of the library. Oh, wait, because it said children. Because right? it said children on the cover, right? So it's 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 for kids, yeah. obviously. And so um, yeah. they they changed that, thankfully. I mean, it's not terrible, terrible. We had all of our Deadpool in the teen, and that oh, our teen is yeah. like young yeah. teen. And that was where I started going. We probably need to have an adult graphic novel section. Well, one of the things that I And they feel uncomfortable yeah. with that. Yes. Section, yeah. right? And then the and then the teens, as far as like say the minor teens, I mean, many of you probably are avid readers, right? You started reading adult books when when you were a teenager, mm -hmm. right? You know, when I was a teenager, there was no young adult category. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So what we did was we actually we took a risk and we we put our adult graphic novels and our teen graphic novels. We kept the children's graphic novels in the children's section. Put our adult gra and graphic novels and our teen graphic novels in the same section. If it had a mature reader's uh, or uh, rating already on it, we put a little green 
be on Google Search and maturely develop the same sequential length as firmware, you know, and decentralize the same security as, but we put it in the same section between the adult and the teen collection. So that was our compromise, to, so that the, neither would feel out of place going to the other section to get their stuff. And that's another great point, especially if you need to justify it to stakeholders, uh, if, you need to, if you'd like to create a collection like this within your library, is um, keeping your, your adult patrons comfortable, because I have had middle-aged men come and uh, thank us for doing this, because they've had to go into the teen section and browse around for a while, and they felt really uncomfortable doing that, and now we have a distinct collection in the adult section, and that's also a way that if the teens are grabbing adult graphic novels, it's another way that we limit our liability in that is just, you know, they're coming into the adult area, you know. So just keep that in mind as well. Let's move on. So using graphic novels with adult learners. Miss Lolly has a lot on this one. So we've already talked a lot about these um, uh, points, but, uh, and, and Steven spoke eloquently about uh, developing multi-literacy. Uh, so what I do with my adult learners, um, is I coordinate our adult literacy program at Escondido Public. Uh, we buy, or I, I purchase actually uh, adult and teen graphic novels. Uh, we don't at the current moment have a lot of uh, juvenile level novels. Uh, I tend to buy a lot of nonfiction memoirs and a lot of uh, classic adaptations uh, because those are stories that resonate with our learners. So again, it's about really taking into consideration your audience, and in my case, my audience is extremely um, specific. Um, image and text interplay is really critical um, because we want learners to make the connection between the vocabulary and what is happening in the novel or in, in the image. Um, and uh, someone had spoken on the previous panel about uh, vocabulary development and uh, Matthew Holm uh, did indicate and studies have shown that uh, vocabulary is significantly higher level in graphic novels than it is in picture books, which is why we go with that medium. Uh, Graphic novels have the power to strengthen uh, narrative and storytelling skills. So we use graphic novels as a teaching tool uh, for students to help develop their own voices. There are uh, lots of sites out there. One uh, notable one is makebeliefscomics.com. And uh, teachers can use this, elementary school teachers, but adult uh, uh, literacy uh, educators also use it because they provide templates where students can develop their own graphic novels and tell their own stories. Uh, Candace touched briefly on how graphic novels in that format may help learners who are from different countries, specifically um, learners who are from Asian countries such as, you know, uh, Korea or um, Japan, where manga is an accepted format, um, a culturally um, specific format. Uh, it can help them acclimate uh, socially to um, to American culture and then help them achieve uh, academic or career success as they develop those critical skills. Um, and lastly, uh, we talked about the maturity of subject matter. Again, when we're dealing with adult learners, we want to use uh, materials that speak to their own experiences. Um, access to content that is otherwise not comprehensible in another format, and really what I'm talking about there are um, re-envisioned uh, versions of classical literature or even graphic novel memoirs. So I have like Steve Jobs memoir, I have uh, Gandhi, I have all of these um, major uh, figures in history uh, where our learners can access that content and not be um, overwhelmed by a larger text. I wanted to address that with a story also. Um, one of our staff members at Escondido has a son who has learning disabilities. Um, he's an older teen. He's a very smart kid, though. And um, he actually started reading some of the adult graphic novels. The teen ones were kind of boring to him, a little kind of below his level. And all of a sudden, one day, he came home and he asked his mom. He said, 
is he, he's been a reluctant reader his whole school career. He struggled. He said, um, is this how everyone, when they read regular books, they can see the pictures in their head? And his mom said, yeah, more or less. You know, as you're reading the descriptions, you kind of see the story in your head. And he said, it's never been that way for me, but now that I'm reading these graphic novels, I can finally see these stories. And he's just, it's like opened up a whole new world for him. He's just been ripping through our adult graphic novel collection. Anybody else? With regards to just uh, uh, maturity of subject matter, one of the things I've uh, worked with with, uh, with your, your graphic novels with adults is uh, many adults have read the books like you just brought in, have read Animal Farm. But many of them may not have read, say, Reaper Vendetta, which is just as just as brilliant a, a take on the topic, and in some ways more accessible take on the topic than uh, either of the other two novels were. And I've started to see that actually being taught in um, maybe more specialist uh, liter literature classes where they, they talk about like a dystopian novel, that kind of thing. Um. So creating a, a diverse and well-balanced collection, I'm um, hearkening back to my last story also, um, there's that, that reading ladder, right? So we've got the classic literature that happens to be illustrated. Um, we buy, I, I also have nonfiction and a lot of memoirs in my collection. Um, I have a lot of horror, I'm, I'm into horror, so we're a little heavy on that. Um, but we have a lot of superheroes, of course, and that's the flashy stuff that brings people in. And um, again, that's where my, our, our colleague's son started with, with some of the superhero stuff. And then maybe some of these classic things aren't so bad. We'll read some Huck Finn that happens to be illustrated. And um, so I think that's been really great. And I also just want to say um, I've had some men in the 35 to 60 demographic say, you know, I, I actually am a creeper. So I'll see people using that section and I'll walk up and be like, what do you like about this? What titles do you want to see? Um, and they were saying that they really were excited because they came over there because they saw the display with the superheroes and they're like, this is the stuff we used to read when, when I was a kid, but now I see that you have something that was on like Oprah's book club list or something like that available too, so I don't feel so silly reading this stuff and I'll get a little bit of everything and so they've been really excited to have that opportunity. I wanna add that representation always matters. Um, no matter what collection you're uh, purchasing for. Uh, with respect to our um, adult learner literacy collections, I really try to collect a lot of nonfiction uh, memoir type of stories, things that will resonate with our learners, um, their cultural backgrounds, uh, their personal histories, um, things that will really draw them into that world. Um, with respect to juvenile collecting, because I also do that, um, I had made that comment to Mike Lawrence about representation because it's really hard sometimes to get anyone um, to pick up a graphic novel. Um, well, actually, let me take that back. Children are never a problem. Children want to read these materials. They're very excited about these materials. Sometimes adults, um, we really have to break through that wall, those stereotypes. Um, that they have, um, it's our role as librarians to really emphasize that um, that there is really that graphic novels can also be very highbrow. That you know those distinctions of highbrow and lowbrow are very harmful when it comes to cultivating people's reading sensibilities, no matter if you're a child, teen, or an adult. I would just say too, um, the culture of reading comics obviously is very much um, we can't get out of the bubble of like the American culture of reading comics and there still is this present thing of the comics code and that comics aren't good for you. I mean, comics have been read by adults throughout the world forever, no. I mean, but what I'm saying is that they're an acceptable thing for you know, uh, adults to read in Asia, adults to read in Europe. I mean, it's sort of an acceptable thing and I think there is still this present lingering stigma that we don't talk about and that really impacts a lot of, let's say, the academic um, collection of comics, how when we're dealing with new professionals, like new teachers and new librarians, that there is still this prevalent stigma attached to it. Um, I told my aunt and uncle I was coming here for Comic-Con and they were like, yeah, but, and I was like, no, I'm really going for work. And they're like, yeah, this comic thing, I don't know. And I was like, all right. 
It's a fad. <laughs> it's just a fad. <laughs> it's a thing. Um, so I, I think it's especially important the collecting widely, collecting diverse collections, collecting well balanced collections, because I think it adds a lot of weight to the argument that when we're talking about comics as being only for kids still or only superheroes, like we're still talking in a very narrow context. Like when we're talking about building diverse collections, that's pull from international publishers, that's pull from small publishers, independent publishers. I think it's super, super important because comics have always been sort of right on, you know, the front lines of um, activism and representation and people making zines and obviously this is what you do. And so I think that's such a great opportunity. Do you want to talk more about your zine? Sure, the Zine Pavilion. That was awesome. Uh, like, sure. I, gu I guess zines are, and and this, to me, encompasses mini comics as a type of like thing. Are, um, and for those that are not familiar with zines, zines are basically like small photocopied magazines that people make. If you if you need an example, come up and talk to me afterwards. Um, so the thing with them and mini comics is that they really are produced by people that you will not find in the traditional media. Um, like, people are making them themselves and putting out their own stories that you will not find um, from major corporations and stuff that are producing this stuff. And so it's really great to find those local stories, to find stories by people that are of um, like minority groups and, and just underrepresented in, in the general media. If I may, um, I wanted to briefly address representation. When I was a boy, my dad's Puerto Rican, my mom is Anglo. When I was a boy, I saw a lot of people in the comics who looked like my mom's side of the family, right? I barely ever see anyone in the comics who looked like my dad's side of the family. You know, it's taken a long time for that to start to change. Now, fortunately, we have people like G. Willow Wilson, who's writing uh, Miss Marvel, um, who is a Muslim woman who's writing about a young Muslim girl who's also a superhero. We have ta Coates, who wrote Between the World and Me, now writing Black Panther. I mean, this is a fantastic, thing for me to see as an adult now to see, okay, I'm starting to see what I always wanted to see when I was a boy. Uh, next, we're going to run through our uh, what our, some of our favorites are, some of the panelists' favorites, but I think we're going to keep this real short because we want lots of time for Q&A. Yep. So I think these are Amy's favorites. Um, this is one of my ones. If you guys don't know, this is The Nib. It is nonfiction political web comics. Um, super awesome, they take headline stories and render them in graphic format. You can sign up for their newsletter, it will appear in your inbox. I love, love, love this. The illustrations are amazing. They have uh, personal stories. They've had a lot of people um, weigh in on like losing their healthcare coverage, for example, personal stories, but they'll cover uh, the headlines. I also think this is a great tool when I'm working with educators or new professionals to just show, again, validity of comics. Um, this one is fantastic. If you guys don't know this, Love is Love, this was a compilation that came out um, for all the benefits go to shooting victims of Orlando. I think it also really shows that comics do have a very strong political message and always have. Um, this is fantastic compilation. Um, so a lot of comic book artists weighed in. You have some of your favorites, um, the small little short stories. And again, it shows that comics just aren't silly. Comics have a very strong political conscience and really always have. So these are some of my favorites, and again, there's some superhero stuff in there, but I think there are some deeper themes in those, um, and Watchmen was my first ever uh, graphic novel, so that was a deep one to delve into. Uh, the bottom one is My Friend Dahmer, and Outcast, if you're not reading and or watching that show, uh, do it, it's awesome. So these are my list of favorite reads, um, so at the top, uh, on the left, we have Something New by Lucy Nisley. I have every graphic novel that she's ever written and published because she's just my favorite person. Um, as I mentioned, I love to collect uh, memoirs for my readers. Um, she is primarily a memoir writer, and so she has chronicled her life in um, various graphic novels like Relish, Age of License. Um, and if you guys are not following her on Instagram, I highly recommend it because she has a super adorable baby. And, um, but more than that, she has been chron chronicling her journey of motherhood. And actually, um, she's been drawing a lot of these pieces and they're going to be published, um, I, I believe by first second. So she has a forthcoming book about um, little baby. Um, right next to that, I have an image from Paper Girls. So are there, um, are there any Stranger Things fans in here? Yeah? Of course, of course, okay. So if you love that show, 
Um, I highly recommend uh, this story. Um, I love that Brian Vaughn has, and um, Cliff Chang, and I, I think Matt Williams, um, they've included a lot of really um, wonderful, they've included a wonderfully diverse cast of characters, and they're all girls, and they're all fierce, so read that one. Um, right in the middle, we have Jillian Tamaki's Super Magic Mutant Academy, um, which is hilarious and um, just wonderful. It's um, published, I think, by an indie publisher, I want to say Drawn and Quarterly. So um, I, it is Drawn. Yes, yes, Canadian, yes, it's, it's wonderful. She's, that's an amazing book. And then right next to it, this one is not out yet. Um, that's by Nidhi Chanani, and it's Pashmina. For, for a second is putting it out, and that's a story of an Indian American girl who finds a magical shawl that transports her back to her, um, sort of her, her motherland, and she basically figures out her identity with that. So I'm very excited for this one. Um, it is a YA, for those of you who are interested in YA, but I think it will resonate with adults. And then at the bottom is um, The Best We Could Do, and that is by T. Bowie, and that's about a Vietnamese American family and their um, refugee experience. Very highly recommended. That's by Abrams. Do you guys want to? So I don't have any slides, but I just want to mention one, which is my lesbian experience with loneliness, uh, which is a, a Japanese comic, um, which is um, really more about, uh, it's a nonfiction, and it's more really more about anxiety and mental health issues than anything else. And it's, uh, it just came out recently, and it's super good. Okay, questions? Or is it going through we had resources just to show that we weren't just talking from our <laughs> top of our heads. <laughs> and I'm just going to leave it on the contact slide if it would go. Oh, it's not going. There it goes. Um, so you can contact us if you have any questions about our resources or, or all the knowledge in our cool head. Uh, okay, questions. And I'll repeat your question so everyone can hear. Anybody? Hands? Yes. I used to work there. <laughs> What's that? Oh, I did. I was there for <laughs> almost 10 years, so. Or the cartoons, yeah. yeah, somewhere in the 700s. So show of hands, have you guys, anybody here that's a librarian, um, had that problem where your adult graphic novels are sort of somewhere? <laughs> somewhere, anywhere <laughs> that people don't know about? Yeah, OK. Um, does anybody want to weigh in besides us on how your library has handled that or how you want to handle that?
I think we addressed that by saying that we uh, at least put labels on things, even if it didn't get a separate section. Did you guys have any other comments on that? <laughs> please, please, please just give it its own section. You know, it's a separate medium, so give it its own section. Absolutely. And, and once you have given it a section, go and pull those ones that are in the Dewey run out. Uh huh. Move them because when Save I find them. stuff, it's it's frustrating to see like, oh yeah, you have three graphing novels in seven point one point whatever, and no one is ever going to find those. Yep. The one thing I'll say though is it drives me crazy because I love like graphic nonfiction is my jam. I hate it when it's shelved with fiction graphic novels because then I think it perpetuates this notion that it's not somehow true. Because mm -hmm. um, we get a lot of teachers who are like, no, but that's fiction. And I was like, no. I have actually seen mouse referred to as fiction. I can't even tell you how many times. I um, literally saw it in a fantasy section <laughs> of a recommended <laughs> books uh, in a library. I and, I, and I was just it. like, <laughs> yeah, it's true. It, it, yeah, it's true. <laughs> it was recommended. Like, I asked them, and it was just like, Please change this, and they just they they, they flip that. So check catalog records. Ooh. Um, any other questions? I don't think so. Really, no questions. Can I just put a plug for, we covered everything for really so good well. RA? I think the thing is with graphic novels is even if you're not a huge graphic novel reader, obviously probably preach in the choir. We need to think about graphic novels when readers advisory. A lot of times we yes. think people read yeah. or they don't read. I like I like to go for subject area. So I'm like, oh wow, you love World War One. You know above the dreamless dead. If you guys haven't checked this one out, it's one of my favorite poetry and illustrations. It's amazing. So it's like you're a World War One buff. Have you seen this one? Uh, Two Generals is another one that's come out. Um, it's from a Canadian publisher. It's really fantastic, World War One. So um, I think going for subject area and really trying to build that advocacy amongst the readers, either in your schools or libraries, so that you are recommending them to people who might not normally read a graphic novel. All right, so if there's really no more questions, um, thank everybody for coming and for your time today, and uh, we'll see you at the con. And if you want any more information, come up and talk to us. Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you.